welcome to this uh, new session of the regular seminar. We have uh, Michael Naon, who's at the Max Planck Institute in uh, Leipzig, and he's going to talk about the free discontinuity approach to optimal profiles in Stokes flows. Okay, so uh, and yeah, okay, I'm going to present this. Uh, so this is a joint work with Dorine Bucure, Antonin Chambol, and Alessandro Giacomini, which is uh, possible to find on that page. Uh, so, ah, <laughs> start. Okay. So here's the plan. First, I will just present a bit the model I'm looking at. Then I will explain all the all the results, and if I have time, I will go over some open questions linked to this problem. Okay. So my setting is the following: I have in all the presentation, omega will be like a rectangle, so it's a black rectangle here, uh, in which I have fluid represented by the flow line in blue, and inside my box I have an obstacle K that for now is a Lipschitz set. Uh, but later it will not be regular. Uh, and it's important that I have a, like a fixed measure. So I have a constraint of measure OK. <coughs> and uh, so my fluid has, a, has an exterior boundary condition. It's equal to a like, constant velocity u infinity, but you can put also variable for velocity. Uh, and so let me put a few assumptions on the, on the equation of the fluid. So I suppose that I am stationary, so I have no dependency on time. I have an incompressible fluid uh, with uh, the exterior foundation u equal u infinity I talked about earlier. Uh, I have a tangency constraint or non-penetration constraint, meaning that the fluid is tangent everywhere to the obstacle, uh, where nu k is normal. I suppose that it verifies Stokes equation, so basically that the divergence of the of the of the tensor sigma is zero where sigma given by minus the pressure plus the symmetric uh, differential of u. Uh, so E of u is a notation I will use, which is uh, the symmetrized gradient of u. And this, this condition is equivalent to having delta u equal the gradient. Uh, and mu here is just a constant for viscosity, but it's not very important. And finally, here it's all, the system is almost closed, but you need an additional uh, boundary condition on the boundary of the obstacle K. Uh, and I put here a Navier boundary condition, which can, you can interpret as uh, some kind of partial, uh, partial adherence constraint. So uh, you have that the, the force exerted locally by the fluid on the obstacle is proportional to the fluid itself, with beta being a constant that like the higher it is, the more, uh, the more friction you have. So typically, if you take formally beta equal infinity, you are in the case of uh, what's called no slip condition, where you have your fluid that has velocity zero around all of the, uh, at, at the bottom of all of the obstacle, which is a condition that is often used. And in this case, we somehow relax a bit this no slip condition to have like a partial, this partial adherence. Uh, and so, one way to see this partial adherence comes up is through uh, homogenization. Basically, if you have a solution of a fluid of a Stokes equation, so here I put Stokes, you can also put Navier Stokes for this one, uh, or with, with zero, uh, zero adherence on the boundary, so you have this equal zero, uh, but the boundary is given by something really irregular, so it's an oscillation. And at the limit, depending on the oscillation, you will see the a solution of the same equation, Stokes or Navier Stokes, with a Navi boundary condition. So here in the drawing, I made the same height and, and the same width, but typically uh, you, you, you will put like epsilon power three half here. So as you see, you have a, a limit lambda in the Navi parameter here, which is given by this quantity. Uh, and here R is like a a matrix that describes uh, the, the geometry of the oscillation. For example, if you do oscillation in only one direction, you block the fluid in only one direction. But in my case, I have no anisotropy like this. Okay, this is a way to see uh, the Nazi condition arise. Maybe I will mention this again later. 
And so I'm going to look at the uh, following functional, which is um, the, the drag of the hexagon K. So the drag of K, you can define it like this. You look at the force exerted on the boundary of, uh, on, on your obstacle. So you integrate the, the tensor sigma uh, against, uh, against uh, the boundary of K. Uh, and then you take the component of this that is in the horizontal direction. It gives you a number, which is the drag of K or the energy dissipated by K. And another way to, uh, to define it is by a variational characterization that I will actually use in priority. Uh, so you can define the drag of K as the minimum of this quadratic energy here, where here you find the viscosity at the, the friction parameter beta, um, the adherence parameter beta. And uh, you, you take it in an admissible set space of smooth function with zero divergence that still verifies the tangent, tangency constraint and the exterior boundary condition. And uh, then the Stokes equation and Navier condition arise from minimizing this quantity. And so the problem I'm interested in is how do you find the shape K that has the lowest drag among every shape that satisfies some condition? <coughs> Okay, so here I put three examples of problems you can look at. Uh, uh, given some measure m, how do you minimize the drag for every set of given measure m? You can also consider the same problem with connected set, which makes kind of sense. Uh, and another problem that we can consider with uh, our theory is to minimize the drag for every set that contains some fixed, some fixed k0. Uh, with some measure constraints uh, uh, so, so that you don't add too much material around, how do you still reduce the drag of your object? And so this question has been considered in many ways. Here I put an example of the work of Tirono in the 70s, uh, where he considered this exact question with uh, no slip condition. So with, you have a velocity u, uh, the obstacle is, is named S, and you have U equals zero on the boundary of the obstacle here. Uh, and uh, here you put a whole scheme of, so you have the box and you have the, the, veloc the velocity is maintained at a constant Z on the boundary of the box. And in this case, what we found uh, through gradient descent, basically through shape derivative method, is that uh, the minimizer should be some kind of ellipsoid, but that is a bit uh, deformed with angles at the ends. Uh, so this is, uh, this is not a 2D result, this is like a 3D with a uh, symmetry of revolution. Okay, but this is, uh, basically, this is like a, uh, not a theoretical result, because in practice, we, we still don't know how to prove uh, that there exists minimizer and that or, and how regular are minimizers for this kind of problem, even with a no-slip condition. But in our case, I will continue with a nice condition. And, okay, first I will simplify... Oh, yeah? So it's obvious why it should be 120 degree angle if you do like first variation or whatever? It's, uh, it's by first variation that they find this, yes. Uh, it's not completely obvious, but mm -hmm. they do it by first variation and basically <coughs> So afterwards, they did this for Navier-Stokes, and for Navier-Stokes, you don't find a symmetric profile. It's not, it's not reversible, mm -hmm. and you find a different angles too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's like this. And, uh, and it's basically the, the contribution of Pirono was finding that you should uh, look for the optimal shape with with angles, not only with smooth shape, because. Yeah. The works before were only smooth perturbation of ellipses. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I will look at instead is a slightly simpler problem. I will add, uh, I will add something, uh, like I will add a penalization of the perimeter. So I don't want to consider shapes for which the perimeter becomes larger and larger. And somehow it's, it's more of a technical issue that uh, we can't control uh, we can't control the sequence of shape with bounded drag if we don't have also a component of the perimeter. So 
why I had this term. You can imagine that C is very small. Nevertheless, we still don't know how to prove that you can completely remove this. So I will look at this for any smooth compact, but I will not have the smooth here, uh, with constant, uh, constant measure. And one thing that you have to take into account is that you can't restrict yourself to smooth sets. Uh, you have to uh, you have to take into account the apparition of low lower dimensional uh, structures that appear on one set. So here, for example, you have a sequence of obstacles. So I did it uh, not symmetric, uh, not connected. That converge in a very nice way to a limit obstacle here. And here you could say, okay, I have a uh, lower dimensional part, I can just erase this one, and this will lower the drive. And this would be true if we had a no slip condition, meaning if we had a fluid that has zero velocity on both sides, then you have some kind of monotonicity where when you reduce your object, you, re you reduce the drive. Here it's not true because in general you will have a, a fluid with different velocities on each side. <coughs> Uh, and so you don't have a monotonicity in, monotonicity in general, so you can't say that when you erase this part, the drag gets lower. If the velocity is very different on both sides, then when you, when you remove this, you make the two sides interact somehow. Uh, so you have to take into account this kind of, uh, this kind of sets. And the, the setting we use is the one of free discontinuity problem with SB, SBV and SBD functions. So the, the basic idea is to uh, first, put fluids everywhere, so it's easier to it's easier to manipulate a function u that is defined everywhere. So we we, we extend u by zero inside the obstacle. So here u basically it has uh, discontinuities around the around the boundary of the obstacle. So the boundary of the discontinuity of u will be a way to define the boundary of the obstacle itself. <coughs> Okay, so this kind of problem, let me just go over two, two uh, classic free discontinuity problems that we take a lot of inspiration from. Uh, the first one is the mumford shaft function. So the mumford shaft functional, originally it was made to do segmentation of images. The idea is that you have some image given by a function g that can be very rough, like some picture, and you want to see the uniform zones in this, in this image with the, the separation along lines. <coughs> and so what you say is that you look for a set of curves gamma and a function u that is smooth outside of gamma, uh, such that gamma represents the sharp transition in the image, and U is like a smoothed version of your image. And so there are several ways, to, many ways to do this, but the Mumford model is to say that you minimize this kind of quantity with maybe different coefficients. So the first one makes you uh, smooth. You can have uh, like sharp changes. The second one um, makes gamma have like not too long, uh, like you can't have too long separations uh, so you need to find a minimal set of curves to, to separate your image. And this one guarantees that you should be somehow close to the original image. And here is an example, was given to me by Le, Antoine Le Menant, um, where you have the original image, so here it's not in gray, but it's uh, And then you split this image into a set of curves here, and, um, and uh, a uniform, uh, uniform uh, locally uniform image view here. So here what you can see is that uh, probably they put a very low coefficient on the penalization of the length because here this function is almost constant outside of the of the separation. So this, it is this kind of uh, this kind of uh, function. And so the Mumford shaft functional it found other uses because it's also a scalar version of something of a model for uh, fracture mechanics. It's typically the, the Griffiths fracture model, uh, where now you have like some sets uh, in R3 for physical, uh, set, for physical setting, some uh, elastic material that is also brittle, meaning it will break when you have too much tension somewhere. Uh, and a model proposed by 
Francfort and Marico to modelize the, to give a modelization of the apparition of these fractures is to see this as an evolution problem. So you have a set of fractures FT that evolve with time in a quasi-static way. <coughs> and then at each time, you suppose that you have some kind of equilibrium between your elastic energy and the fractures given by this functional. So basically, you have an equilibrium between the area of the fracture that appear in your, uh, in your uh, object and the elastic energy. <coughs> so of course, in general, the elastic energy is a bit more complicated, but here I put a simpler version. Uh, and, uh, and here, basic, basically, F, FT is a set that can only increase with time because you can close the fracture. And then you have to add, this is a linearized model, of course, and then you have to add some constraint to make uh, physical sense, but uh, it is, you can notice it is very close to, uh, to uh, our problem because it's basically the same functional. You don't have like the integral of u square on the fracture set, but aside from this, it's the same functional. The big difference is in the, uh, um, uh, in the fact that here you consider every vector field u. Uh, not just vector fields that are divergence free and that are already tangent to the, to the fracture. Because being tangent to the fracture is not really something that would make very much sense in fracture mechanics. Uh, you, you could ask that the fracture do not open too much, but not that the, the vector field is completely tangent. But okay, it's still pretty similar to ours, so we use uh, the same kind of idea. And so the big idea behind this is uh, to relax the problem in a set in a set of uh, discontinuous function uh, that I call that we call SBD. So it's special bounded deformation function. So it's every function u that is like locally integrable for which the derivative in the sense of distribution, so the symmetric derivative in the sense of distribution, is given by two terms by an absolutely continuous part. So this is a function. L1 function, and a set of jumps. So you have a set GU that is typically a, a hypersurface. Uh, and, and along this hypersurface, which has a, a normal vector nu u, you have always two different values of, of u on, on each side. You have u plus u minus. And so the, the derivative is given by the, this jump between the two values along the, along, uh, the ZGU. So in one, this is very easy. Uh, it's just a sum of Dirac's. Uh, but in higher dimension, it's more. And, uh, and yeah, and the, set of, the, the set of jumps, GU, you can just see this as um, every point around which, when you zoom in, you see only two values along an hyperplane. Like you have a half plane with, with the value U plus and a half plane with the value U minus. And, uh, and, uh, yes. and in general, the so SBD is a special, like, special bounded deformation because it's a special case of BD function for which you have like an additional term in the decomposition. So in 1D, it's typically like contour staircase. And basically, we remove this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, functions from our analysis. Okay. And so, here are the few existence and regularity results. So we need to, so we need to define the problem first, like define an admissible set, so a set of impermissible flows. So I call like nu of uh, uh, v of uh, omega, every discontinuous function u that verifies the two constraints, so being divergence free, which you can understand either in the sense of distribution or uh, or like the, the absolutely continuous part being divergence free, it's, it's equivalent here. And you have uh, being tangent to its jump. tangent to its jump. And then basically, uh, a function u is admissible when you have uh, all those exterior boundary conditions. And its energy is given by the same formula as the drag. But here you integrate on all, all the sets the e of u squared. And here, along the jump of u, you integrate the u plus square and u minus square. And here, I have only the function u, but actually, 
it's better to do we have any shadow? Actually, it's, it's easier to manipulate, like you have the inside of your obstacle is a set E, and then you have some jump part outside, like this. Uh, and your function u is zero inside the set E, and it's maybe non zero inside. And the, the lower dimensional part, so they are not included in the set E, but they are part of the jump G. Uh, and this part is also part of the jump G U, but it's also the boundary of the set E. So typically, if you have an obstacle E, so the E is like the interior of the obstacle, and the function u, you say it's admissible when u is zero inside your obstacle. Makes sense. Uh, and uh, then you can still define the same energy, so it's the drag of u plus c times the perimeter of e. So here we count like once the perimeter here, and then twice the perimeter here, because it's like if you see it as a limit of uh, of a set. Uh, Shrinks into a lower, lower dimensional part, it makes sense to count it twice. Okay, so now we have this we have this energy here. So here we did a relaxation, and it's not completely clear that um, you have a density like that you can approximate every uh, admissible set, uh, admissible uh, couple like this with a smooth uh, smooth function. But okay, now we have this relaxation. And so the first theorem is the theorem of existence in this relaxed setting. So uh, just the fact that if you take a sequence of functions, an admissible sequence UI so sort of incompressible flows, uh, with bounded, uh, bounded drag and bounded length of discontinuity, then you find some conversion subsequence that converge in still in your admissible set and with a drag that is lower at the limit. Uh, okay, so here there are basically three steps, like three things to verify. The first one is that there exists some convergence of sequence. So this is not it's something that was did already for uh, Griffith's problem. Uh, so basically, up to extraction, uh, because BD embeds compactly into L2, uh, you can find uh, you can find some subsequence that converges in L2. It's a result from Bellini, Koshan, and Mazo. Then, U is, the limit U here, we only know that it's SBD for now. We need to verify that it's in a good uh, admissible set. Uh, so we need to verify these two constraints. The first one is actually a bit easy, because if you take this in the sense of distribution, and you have a convergence in L2, then at the limit, it's still verified. The second one we have to check by hand, because uh, you need to take into account, like, uh, what happens when you have a convergence of jumps like this, that are like this, to a flat jump? Or what happens if you have a jump like this that is a bit open, that converges also to a flat jump? And it's not obvious that just because you have the tangency constraint that is verified here, it will be verified at the end, or similarly here. So we have to check this one back then. And then we have to check also that the the drag is lower semi-continuous. So in the drag, there are several terms, but the elastic energy, it's already known. But basically, it's not known that energies like this, so for us, it's with u plus square and u minus square. So it's not known that this kind of energy is semi-continuous. Okay. Well, let me explain briefly how the point two and three are obtained. So the point two is through something called the symmetrically jointly convex functions. So it's using a recent result of Friedrich, Perugin, and Solombrino. The idea is that we prove the constraint by a lower semi-continuity result. We prove that the, this stuff above here is lower semi-continuous, so the product of the trace with um, the normal. In our case, this is going to be zero. But if it's zero for every term of the sequence, it's still zero as a limit. And so it's a general result for uh, for energies like this, so integral of the jump of some functions of the traces and of the direction. And uh, uh, so in our case, it's given by this function here. And so, Kulich, Perugini, and Slombrino prove that this kind of 
energy was uh, lower semi-continuous on the condition that uh, theta is something called a symmetrically jointly convex function. So being symmetrically jointly convex means that uh, this is given by some supremum of difference of uh, vector field evaluated in A minus B, times nu. Uh, and this vector field have to be gradients of functions. So for, for BV functions, for like, like, like the scalar case, there is also a notion of joint convexity, which is basically the same definition, but here you have any vector field. Here, uh, the only difference is that you have, you have to consider gradients of uh, functions. And so in our case, it's, uh, it's not completely obvious how to write this one as a gradient, but basically, if you consider gk of x, which is some function of the norm of x, we can write it like this, where phi is phi k uh, spans like one Lipschitz function. Uh, so like it's like a, it's like a dense set, of, dense subset of one Lipschitz uh, compact support one Lipschitz function. Then you see that uh, this supremum is going to give this. Almost, uh, you have to, to put some perturb you have to add some perturbation. Okay, so here this is the first semi-continuity. The second one, we are not able to prove that it's symmetrically jointly convex, so we have to prove by hand that it's actually lower semi-continuous. So for the second one, what we say is that it's enough to prove it, to prove the lower semi-continuity in a much simpler setting. You suppose that. Uh, You suppose that you are like in a square and you have a function that converges to something that is constant on both sides of the square with a jump in the middle. So you have like a sequence of functions that is almost u plus, almost u minus, like with some jump in the middle. Uh, okay, so, so you say that you have like an L1 convergence with the elastic energy conversion to zero. And the jump being bounded, but you can have like the, like the jump may cross a few times, or may, may not be a graph. Uh, and then under this condition, you prove that uh, the, the energy inside the square is lower than uh, the energy inside of this. Uh, so it's, uh, it's higher than just the energy of the constant function that is u plus here, u minus here with uh, segment as a jump, which is exactly phi of u plus plus phi of u minus. And so here this kind of thing we do by slicing, basically by looking at 1D sections of, uh, of our function. And this kind of thing is pretty, it's pretty standard for a scalar case, like for BV function. Because what you're going to say is, uh, so I take uh, a segment here where my function is almost u plus, and I I look at the one d section. So I look at a raise that goes below like this, and this, these segments they are going to meet the jump set somewhere. Most of these segments are going to meet the jump set, and then uh, if you are almost u plus here. You can say that the value of your function is still almost u plus along all, along all the segments here. It's a bit small, sorry. Uh, and so basically, you can say that you have a good part of, of a seg of uh, segments that cross all the square with the uh, value u plus everywhere. So this is for the scalar case. Here, the, the small issue is that in the in the bounded deformation setting, you don't really have access to, uh, like when you look at one dissection, you don't really have access to the function itself, but only the projection of this function. So when we take a segment like this, you only have the, the direction of uh, C, you only have access to C times U along this, proje along this projection. And so what we do basically is uh, throw, uh, throw rays like this in many different directions. And we can say that many, there are many points uh, along the jump that can be seen from 
uh, enough direction to completely deduce the function. Uh, okay, this is uh, so this one is by uh, it's by slicing, and by the way this one so we don't know if it's a jointly convex function or not. It's just that we we had a different proof. Okay, so this is it for the existence, and then we have like some regularity result. So here regularity is taken in a very low sense. Um, regularity we take it in the in the sense that. Uh, you have an optimal shape, this shape is closed, basically. So, like you have an optimal shape of a boat, so your boat is not dense in the water. Uh, for now, we can't hope for much more. So, basically, having regularity is like saying that we are some, in some kind of classical setting, and the classical setting would be the setting where we consider closed obstacle. <coughs> Okay, so we say that a, a minimizer is strong when the obstacle is a closed set. And to be closed, um, what you need, more or less, is that uh, here the jump part are not too, uh, too dense. So the bad case would be what? Would be like you have an obstacle here, and then you have jumps like this. You have a lot of very small jumps that, that form the dense subset of the fluid. And then the distance of this jump is uh, like the whole set. So our goal is to prove that uh, VU is closed up to some negligible set. And this, so we only have in 2D. So for no, for no one, I'm in 2D. And in 2D, if I have some minimizer of the drag, of, or quasi minimizer of the drag, uh, quasi being, uh, it's because you have to take into account like measure constraint, but. Uh, so if you have a minimizer of the drag into D, then the jump set is closed. Uh, so there are similar results for the other free discontinuity problems I mentioned. So for Manforcha, there are several proofs, but the first one is uh, the one from 88 by Georgi Carrero and Nachi. Uh, and uh, it's basically the one we rely on also. And for the Griffiths energy, it's uh, more recent. It's, uh, Simultaneous uh, two, pa two papers, uh, two simultaneous papers of Conti, Conti, Focardi, Urlano, and Schauble, Conti, and Urlano for 2D minimizer and for any dimension. And actually, the one we rely on is more of this, of the, the proof for any dimension, which itself used like compactness method similar to the, the original proof for Manforcha. <coughs> So, what do we want to avoid? As I said earlier, we want to avoid like very diffuse jump set. So the worst that could happen is you have like in some uh, in some uh, square you have a very very low density of jumps, and then you zoom on some part and you see a high density of jump, and then you would zoom again on some part and you have a low density, and here you would again zoom again zoom on the, on the red segment that have a high density. So basically, you have an oscillation of the density between a, a high value, like a unit, unit value, and a very low density. And we want to avoid this kind of phenomenon. So what we want to say is that, uh, is that like we have two terms in our energy, and once the jump term is small enough, then it disappears when you zoom in. So here we work with squares like QXR is a square of center x for the star. <coughs> and so what we say is, so we take a simplified version of the energy. We don't need to take like the full energy for this, with the elastic energy and the jump part. Uh, typically, in a, in a very favorable setting, the first part wants to be of homogeneity 2, basically, of order r square, and the second one wants to be of order r. So what we say is, so we normalize by the order of the second one, and we say that as soon as the second one uh, is small enough, so the jump set is small enough, then at every smaller scale, you have a, you have a decay of the energy. So you know that the, the dynamic is controlled by the first term and not the, not the second one. So here, to be more precise, if we have this at some fixed scale r, that is small enough already, then at every smaller scale, we have a smaller and smaller constant here. And this implies basically that 
<coughs> since you can do this not necessarily only around the point x, but every point in the neighborhood of x, uh, this implies that the, the jump set here has no, has no, no density point near x. So basically, as soon as the energy is small enough in a, in a square, then in a smaller square, let's say like r over 2, you have zero jump. And then once you have zero jump on the, the square r over, r over 2, it's just a solution of Stokes equation. It's completely smooth. So, and this is enough to, to imply that uh, the jump set is uh, essentially closed. <coughs> so, uh, the main, uh, the main like the, the main lemma of the proof is a smoothing lemma uh, where we want to say that any vector field, like not only minimizer, but any uh, incompressible vector fluid that has few jumps, we can, appro we can approximate it by some smooth vector field. So the way we say it is, you take the vector field in a square uh, with very few jumps, and u is still like divergence free and tangent to the jump. And then, in a slightly smaller square, so you have to change a bit the size of the, the square, you can modify u into a function v. Uh, so, so v here is, on the outer layer, it's equal to u. Inside, it's a subordinate function, so it's a, and it's even a smooth I think it's probably C infinity. Um, and the energy of v is not too far from the energy of u. So what we say is that the energy of V, the elastic energy, is lower than some, some term that is close to 1 times the energy of U. And so here the main challenge is that we have to do this kind of modification while still preserving the divergence-free constraint and the tangency constraint. Uh, and so, so for example here, you can see that this lemma will only work in 2D because uh, the choice of radius here is made such that you, you don't see any jump crossing the square. Like here, you, here you, can, you can choose a square that do not cross, that do not meet any jump in red, uh, which is not possible in, uh, in 3D. Okay, so we have this, and then we can use this to, to make something by compactness. Okay, so first, how do we get this one? So the idea behind this is, uh, is basically to, uh, so you, you take the, the square inside, you choose the radius appropriately, and then you are going to apply core lemma inside. So this is the square inside, and then you cut it in smaller, small square inside, and then smaller and smaller square near the boundary. So it's like a dyadic decomposition. Uh, and inside each square, you can do this such that you still have a low density of jump sets in every, every square here. Inside each square, you apply corn inequality. So corn inequality, you might know for like Sobolev function, where uh, you say that the symmetric gradient controls uh, the full gradient up to some uh, uh, solid displacement. In SPD, it's slightly more uh, complicated. Uh, so I have one slide uh, on, on the, the version we, I use from uh, Chambol, Comte, and Frankfurt. Uh, so the idea is the following. You are, you are still in a square and you might have some jump set, like a small jump set like this, that completely separate uh, what's, what's happening here from what's happening here. So you can't expect just an inequality of, let's say, grad, uh, uh, grad u, u minus a for some uh, affine function a in only just uh, E of U. you. You can't expect this kind of inequality because you can just put a very small part here that uh, where U is very large, for example. So it's a corn inequality after, that you get after removing some bad set. So the way they do it uh, is basically by choosing a simplex. So you take a point here, a point here, and a point here. Yeah, make a small jump. And then, you want to consider only, only points of, uh, of the square from which you can see all three of these points. Basically, from which you can do like a linear interpolation, like this, for example. And you are going to, to, 
to choose the value at, the, at this point by a linear interpolation of what happens at this point. And so the only point that for which you don't have this property is basically by so say casting the shadow like this set here. Uh, this set here and this set here. So you remove all these bad sets that we call omega in the, in the serum. Um, and, and after removing what happens here and replacing it by a affine function, you know that you can do like a linear interpolation by a sum function A and you get Korn's inequality like this. Okay, and then there is a so this is to get the first two points. Basically, the third point is a refinement uh, to say that you, you have like a smoothing of you that is a good approximation. Uh, okay, this is called inequality in SP. And so once we have this, uh, then uh, then to prove, to prove the stuff I mentioned earlier, we do it by contradiction. So you can do rescaling, and I suppose that you have a sequence of minimizer UI that all have the same energy. Like the same elastic energy, but with lower, uh, with smaller and smaller jumps. And, uh, and so UI is a minimizer, and you want to say that they verify some decay estimate. Like in a, in a slightly smaller ball, the energy is lower than some factor times the energy in the whole ball. <coughs> and so what we do is we consider the smoothed version of the UIs. So you apply the smoothing lemma. Uh, so you get functions VI. This VI is used like the regular core inequality. You can say that they converge to some limit that is a minimizer. So you have a smooth minimizer W. And W is a smooth minimizer, so it's completely, it's like a biharmonic function. So it's a gradient of a biharmonic function. So on the limit, you have decay estimate. And then since you have a decay estimate on the limit, you will have decay estimate for some term UI for, for large enough I. We don't know for which one, which is why it's still a proof by compactness. Okay, and then this implies like a, a decay estimate that you can iterate to get, uh, to get uh, the lower density result I mentioned earlier. Okay. And that's it. So I can mention a few open questions. Uh, <coughs> okay, so first, uh, I. I said I was doing the regularity of minimizer, but this was a very low regularity. And you could wonder what, what about like uh, knowing that the, the boundary is a C1 curve, for example. So there are recent work of Babajo, Orlando, and Le Menon, and I should update also with uh, Le Menon and Labouri around uh, like the, the C1 alpha regularity for, for the fracture problem, for the Griffiths, uh, for the Griffiths model, under some condition in 2D into at least. Uh, and it's really not clear that this kind of method also works in our case because of our additional constraints. Then there's also the regularity in 3D because all the regularity, like the, the smoothing lemma I presented, works only in 2D and it'd be nice to see uh, to what extent uh, you can extend it in 3D. Uh, then there's also the perimeter penalization because in the beginning I added the, like a perimeter term and I said that we can probably remove it, but I don't know how. And for scalar problem, like for, uh, for free discontinuity with sc scalar value free discontinuity like this, it's usually a property you have that uh, you can restrict yourself to functions which are non-degenerate in, in some way. Like your function u can only take value zero or above a fixed threshold, but not, not a small non-zero value. Here it's not clear. Uh, not clear because if you have a minimizer like this, uh, then the velocity with the corner here, then the velocity here is probably going to be zero because it needs to be tangent both to this and to this. So it's not clear in this case. Uh, and then we have like nu numerics computation, like how to, how to do numerics with this model. So typically for uh, for the Memforsha model, one way to do uh, numerics is to do a phase field approximation. So like you approximate um, the, the set of discontinu discontinuous curve gamma by some smooth function z 
that is going to be one outside, of, outside your, your set of curves and zero in the curves. But z varies on the scale of epsilon. So typically, uh, so it, it's a one diversion. You have like a function z with value one, and you have the two, two values u minus and u plus. And then when you have a jump, z decreases like this and decreases again. And u is going to transition in the in the zone where z is zero between the two values. Uh, and okay, so this is uh, something reasonable for our case. Uh, we want to appro approximate the, the the space where the fluid is by some smooth function that uh, between zero and one. Uh, and a reasonable so uh, like a reasonable approximation of of the full functional is given by something like this. So you have z squared in front of the elastic energy. So in the place where z is zero, the elastic energy is not penalized, so you can change however it wants. And then you have some um, penalization of, the, of the, the changes of z, of the transitions. However, there is an issue with this model, which is that uh, first you have to take into account the, the divergence-free constraints. So here you take only divergence-free vectors, for example. And then you have to take into account the tangency constraint. So the fact that when you have a, a transition, you need u to be tangent to this transition, even if now it's not a sharp transition, it's something on the scale of uh, width epsilon. So it's not clear what will be in this. Okay. Uh, and yeah, okay. I have a final one, which is uh, whether you can generalize all these results to Navier-Stokes. Uh, so here I, I rewrote the full equation, but by adi adding uh, the non-linear term of Nash Stokes here. So the drag is still has the same formula. And the question is, is there a minimizer for this problem, for this exact problem? Probably not. Uh, but it's for an interesting reason, so I can still uh, implement it. Uh, here you probably don't have a minimizer for, for this exact problem because of the homogenization phenomena I, I mentioned earlier. So earlier, I mentioned that uh, <coughs> when you have like a boundary but with oscillations like this, uh, then at the limit, what, what you see is a new Navi condition. So here, for example, you have, you have a Navi condition like this along the, the homogenized boundary, at the limit, you see a Navier condition like this. So here you have the parameter of beta, and here you have something more than beta. Basically, you can increase the adherence by adding oscillation, which can make sense. And uh, for Stokes' problem, for the linear problem, you never do this, right? Because when you increase the parameter beta here, you increase this energy. But here, since it's not an energetic problem, uh, it's not always true. So it's something that Bucur and Ponivar uh, proved uh, numerically. They took like, uh, um, so they, they fixed the shape with like a, a large ball with, that contains the fluid and the smaller ball inside. Uh, and they fixed uh, the velocity around like this. And then they optimized, so not the shape here, but the adherence parameter beta. So you have an adherence parameter beta of x around here. So beta is, let's say, larger than 1 everywhere, which is like the natural adherence. But you are allowed to make it larger than, strictly larger than 1 in some place. And what they found is that for high viscosity, is close to the Stokes problem, the minimizer is just beta equal one everywhere. It seems to be beta equal one everywhere. But when you have a low enough viscosity, uh, then you, you, you need to make some profile like this for beta. So basically, you, have, you add some oscillation here, and also in the other side, similarly here. Uh, and so you add a difference on both ends of your, of your object. And here it makes the drag go from 0.2408 to 0 0.2405. So it's a good gain. Uh, so this one, basically, you add more adherence and you decrease the drag. 
So this means that the result I presented uh, as they are, they, can, they don't really straightforwardly, like they don't generalize in a straightforward way to Nagistos, but maybe some, some, some relaxation would generalize to Nagistos. <laughs>